Christmas now. Well, let's start with Kill Your Darlings because you had uh, well, Daniel Radcliffe. Well, I think we show. both had Daniel Radcliffe, but I was the one. You, who you did, did the interview, interview yeah, fine. Yes. And so uh, essentially, the story is it's um, the early life of Allen Ginsberg. Allen Ginsberg, uh, whose father is a poet, goes to uh, Columbia University. When he gets to Columbia University, he's uh, initially he's he's quite uptight. He's quite anxious. He's quite withdrawn. He's, you know, he turns up wearing the spectacles, looking very very sort of. You know, Harry Potterish. No, no. I wait. Well, I'm, I think it's it just looking sort of out of place and looking difficult. The first thing that happens is that he bumps into uh, Lucien Carr, who's played by Dane DeHaan, who is this kind of free spirit. And in the course of the the, the drama, he will then be introduced to Kerouac and to Burroughs, and together they will kick over the tables of the establishment and totally reinvent literature. Blah blah blah. blah. Here's a clip. Brahms. Finally. An oasis in this wasteland. So how come you're not at the social? Oh, only the most anti-social. I have to go to an event actually called one. Libation? What, you drink in your room? How does a horrible bottle of Chianti sound? I, I don't drink. Freshman? Yes. Excellent. I love first times. I want my entire life to be composed of them. Life is only interesting if life is wide. To Walt Whitman. And there is an awful lot of that. Now, here is the thing with uh, Kill Your Darlings. Firstly, I think it's well played. I think Daniel Radcliffe actually does a pretty good... I mean, when somebody first said, you know, Daniel Radcliffe is playing Alan Ginsberg, because of, generally you're thinking of Ginsberg as later on in life, and with all these characters, this is kind of like the early years. This is like Butch and Sundance, mm. the early years. So that casting doesn't immediately spring to mind, but he, I think he does a very good job. I think he's, you know, he's very convincing as this character who's kind of, you know, withdrawn and anxious and nebbishy and then kind of comes out of himself and, you know, becomes part of this, of, of, of the Beat Poets. I also think that it's directed with a degree, I mean, clearly with a degree of passion, if not flair. I mean, one of the things that's strange is that they spend all the time talking about, you know, overturning the tables, about getting rid of the rules, about, you know, inventing the new vision, about creating new ways of thought, new ways of seeing and being free. And yet the film itself actually, formally, is pretty straightforward. You get all the things that you usually get in these movies. You know, you get the thing of the guy typing and he's typing with jazz going on in the background or the guy smoking in a cafe and trying to scribble stuff down and all the stuff's all going on in the background. I mean, the fact of the matter is, it is pretty hard as director after director Director, director, director discovered to dramatize the act of writing and the act of creating poetry or creating literature. Okay, it's not something that's very easy. I mean, Terry Gilliam famously had the, that, that sort of you know great problem when he was doing Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. Which, when you're doing Hunter Thompson, how do you dramatize Hunter Thompson writing this great bit of literature about the, the wave breaking and then rolling back? And in the end, they fall back and well, we'll just have him at the typewriter and then the voiceover. So formally, it's fairly ordinary. I mean, it's well done. I think it's very uh, honest in the way that it deals with the characters' uh, sexualities and the way in which that uh, impinges upon, you know, what they're doing and their relationships with each other and their relationships literature. The problem that I have with it, and I suspect you have the same thing, is at the very beginning, there's this thing about, you know, they're sending millions to fight fascists in Europe, but the fascists are here, meter and rhyme. We must kick over. And you, part of you thinks, no. And once it's within the context of that, that there is all this other stuff going on in the world, and essentially what we've got here is a revolution happening in, in, in a university library. And it does then lead on to something else, which is that there's this tale of love and death which unfolds, which is sort of somewhere at the beginning of the people. I find, my problem is that I find them very hard company. Now, I think you could argue that the film does that deliberately. It says, look, they're narcissistic. But I, I think my feeling about it was, was that the film liked the characters. I mean, you, you know, you have to like characters when you're making a film about them in order for the drama to sort of, to fly to some extent. And I just found them very hard company. So I think the film itself was solidly done and well played. And, you know, Dana Hart is clearly a star in the making. I and mean, he does look extraordinarily like a young Leonardo DiCaprio. And uh, Daniel Radcliffe continues to do roles which demonstrate that, you know, that, I mean, it's you did that interview with him, and you didn't even mention Harry Potter, and it was you just mentioned it now because of the glasses. But the fact of the matter is, you know, he's a he's a he's, he's a hardworking, properly versatile actor who's obviously you know branching out in a number of roles. You know, he's done the Woman in Black, and now he's doing this. Great. The problem is, I find these people very very hard company, and consequently, I found the film a bit of a a bit of a chore. I found it like, yeah, fine, kick over the tables, cut up the books, turn over the stuff, fine. Would you mind doing it next door? Because I'm a little bit tired of it, and I have yet to find a film about this it's similar you know you had a similar problem with on the road Ugh. 
Well, that noise that you just made, did, did you not have a bit of that with Kill Your Darlings? Well, I did in as much as, uh, precisely as you said, and I, I did mention this to, to Danny Radcliffe when he came on, the fact that they mentioned that there is this war going on. Yeah, somewhere makes, else. It makes everything that they're bothered about seem entirely... Irrelevant. I irrelevant. And it might be that they felt as though they had to mention the fact that World War Two was uh, happening at the same time. But it was a bit like when you talk about other movies and you get really irritated by the people because you don't care about them or their lives or the things that they're concerned with. I thought, well, I, I think this is very well played and you are doing a very good job. I just don't care about meter and rhyme, not in this context, you know. So it just seems mm. to be that the things that they're bothered about are utterly irrelevant. And there is also the thing about, you know, there is you know, running into libraries, getting books, cutting them up and, you know, replacing books that are in shell. Oh, there's a great big trophy cabinet of this is the first folio of Hamlet and this is the whatever it is. But they replace them with rude, racy books. You think, yeah, great. You have time for tea or not? So that was it. So a well-played, quite ordinarily, uh, you know, laid out tale about people whose company I found five minutes with them was more than enough. <laughs> that's that's not three stars or two. Anyway, I don't know what that is, but that's... It's, it's, it's kind of in the middle. I mean, if you're... It's it, worth going to see. It, it's an interesting... Well, it's worth seeing you for, the, for the performance. You wouldn't invite them home, though. Yeah, no. No, you wouldn't. <laughs>